We're going to need you for second years because Mr. Walker likes that so much. I've worked for Mr. Walker for 10 years and I know him well. Although he's selfish, he's charming and perfect man to marry. It's the old lady bride of Mrs. Norwich woman. She always wants her daughter Miss Fairbanks to marry well. But actually, she's now devoted to a man called Ernest. Oh, that must be Mr. Loving. How are you, my dear fellow? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Oh, eating as usual, I see LG. Who's coming to tea? Oh, really, Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn? Oh, how perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well. But I'm afraid that Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. Well, may I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. Well, I am in love with Gwendolyn. Indeed, I've come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you had come up for pleasure. Proposal? I'll call that business. How utterly romantic. I really don't see anything romantic about proposing. It is very romantic to be in love, but there is nothing romantic about a romantic proposal. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If ever I get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. Well, I've no doubt about that, dear LG. The divorce court was specially invented for those whose memories are curiously constituted. <laughs> Oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Oh, please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. Uh, have some bread and butter. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Hmm. very good bread and butter it is too. My dear fellow, you need not eat as if you were going to eat it all. You behave as if you were married to her already. You're not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Well, why else do you say that? Well, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin, and before I allow you to marry her, you have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? Well, what do I do mean? LG, what do I do mean? By Cecily. Well, I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. Lucy, bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, do you mean to say that you have had my cigarette case all this time? Well, I wish to goodness you have let me know. Thank you. And now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that this thing isn't yours after all. But of course it's mine! But this isn't your cigarette case. This is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes, charming old lady. She still lives at Tumbridge. <clears throat> I'll just get you back to the LG. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Turbridge Wells from Little Cecily with her fondest love? Well, my dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall and some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. Well, that's absurd. For heaven's sake, give me back my secret case. But why does she call herself Little Cecily? And if from Little Cecily, with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack, she calls you her uncle, but you said that she is your aunt. Uh, there's no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, would call her own nephew her uncle? 
I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack, it's Ernest. Well, it isn't Ernest, it's Jack. But you have always told me it was Ernest. I've introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. Your look seems to be that your name is Ernest. You're the most honest looking person I ever saw in my life. It is perfectly absurd that you're saying your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. And here is one of them, Mr. Ernest Worthy, before the Omni. I'll keep this as a proof that your name is Ernest if ever you attempt to deny it to me, to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. But and that cigarette case was given to me in the country. This does not account for the fact that your small aunt Cecily believed the Tunbridge Wells for your uncle. Come, oh boy, you had much better have the thing out at once. Tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed bunburyist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Oh, bunbury? Oh, what do I actually mean by a... I refer to the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you're kind enough to inform me why you're earnest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette face first. Here it is. Now produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. Well, my dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. The Earl of Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy and gave me, made me his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle in motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country and under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prison. Where is that place in the country, by the way? Well, there's nothing to you, dear boy. You're not going to be invited. Then tell me what the earnest in town and Jack in the country. My dear fellow, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of a guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness. In order to get out of town, I've always pretended to have a young brother of the name of Ernest, who lived in the Albany and gets into most dreadful slips. My dear LG, that's the whole thing pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be tedious if it were either. What you really are is a Burberryist. I was quite right in saying that you were a Burberryist. You are one of the most advanced Burberryists I know. Oh, what on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest. In order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury. In order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. And Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. Oh, I'm not a Bunbury at all. If Gwendolyn's a sex. I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It's, it's rather more so. I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you to, the, to do the same with this term. Well, with him, first friend who has to have certain name. Nothing will part with me. You'll make part with Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There is such a lot of beastly competition about. Oh, that must be Aunt Augusta. Lady Breno and Miss Fairfax. Aunt Augusta? Good morning, Algernon. I hope you're behaving very well. I'm feeling 
very well, Aunt Augusta. Does not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear, you are smart. I'm always smart. Am I not, Mr. Dorothy? Oh, you're quite perfect, Miss Bat. I hope I'm not that. I will leave no room for development, and I intend to develop many directions. I'm sorry we are late. And now, I'm, uh, I will have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. I'll help you out. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Thank you, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Oh, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? Lucy, tell me why. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I ran down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. That will do, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm greatly distressed, Aunt Esther, about there being no cucumbers. It really makes no, no matter. Uh, uh, I'm afraid, Aunt Augusta, I have some difficulty in the music of the party on Saturday. I'll run over the program of Strada if you can't come into the next room for a moment. Oh, a charming date has been this bad night. Pray don't talk about the weather, Mr. Wilkins. Whenever people talk about the weather, I feel quite certain that they mean something else. Well, and that makes me nervous. Well, I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. And I'd like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bretnell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back steadily into a room, and I have often had to speak to her about it. Fairfax, ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any girl I've ever met since I met you. I am quite well aware of that, and I always wish that in the public you'd be more demonstrative. For me, you always have an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live in a world of ideals, Mr. Mary. And my ideal is always the love song of the name of Alice. There is something in the name that inspired absolute confidence. The more actual knowledge that he had a friend called Alice, I knew I was destined to love you. Oh, you really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Oh, darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Alice. <laughs> but, Gwendolyn, do you mean to say that to love me if my name was an Ernest. But your name is Ernest. Yes, I know it is, but supposing it was something else, do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Well, personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care about the name of Ernest. I don't think it exists me at all. But it suits you perfectly. It's a divine name. It has some music of its own. It produces vibration. <laughs> well, really, Gwendolyn. I must say there are lots of other much nicer names, I think. Ah, uh, Jack, for instance, a uh, charming name. Jack? Yes. No, no. There is very little music in the name Jack. It's the love thrill. It produces absolutely no vibration. And I have no self for Jack, and all more than usually pain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity of job. Pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She will probably never be allowed to enjoy the intrinsic pleasure of single woman solitude. The only really same name is Ernest. Well, I must get fresh at once. Well, I mean, Gwendolyn must get married at once. There's no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Willie? Well, surely. You know that I love you. And you led me to believe, Miss Fairbank, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, Mr. Lennon. But you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said about about marriage. The subject has not ever been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? 
I think it's an admirable opportunity. And to spare you from any possible disappointment, Mr. Willing, I think it's only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I'm fully determined to accept you. Oh, Gwendolyn. Yes, Mr. Willing, what have you got to say to me? You know what I've got to say to you? Yes, but you just don't say it. Well, will you marry me, Gwendolyn? Of course I will, oh, darling. How long you have been about it? I always afraid you have had a little experience in how to propose. Oh, my own one. I've never loved anyone in the world but you. Hmm, I know it. Men always propose for practice. What wonderful little eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite... Quite believe me. And I always wish that you could look at me just like that. Especially there are other people present. Ernest, I love you. <laughs> of course I do. Eh? I really don't know. 
Thank you, Sleep Rattle. I said, I lost both my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents in trembled. I don't know who I am by birth, and I was. I was. I was found. Found? Yes, I was found. The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of very kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing. Because he happened to have the first class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Uh, well, Worthing is a place in Sussex, it's a seaside resort. Well, the, the charitable gentleman who had his first class ticket for this seaside resort found you. <sighs> in a handbag. You had that? Yes, I was in a handbag. Uh, somewhat large, like a handbag. With handles to it, well, an ordinary handbag, in fact. You want to look at it that this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag in the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was, it was given to him in the state closer. Welcome from a Victoria station. Yes, the bright one. The lightest material. Mr. Welding, I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born or remain to wear in a handbag, no matter how talented or not, seems to me to display contempt for the ordinary decency of family life. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a program at a railway station, the subject considered is also in this question, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. Well, may I ask you then what you would advise me to do, Lady Bradlow? I, I need hardly say that I would do anything in the world to ensure women's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthy, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible and to make a definite effort to produce my parent, a register, before the season's quite over. Well, I don't know how I could possibly manage to do that. But I can produce a handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home, and I think that should satisfy you, Lady Reynolds. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that Lord Brandon and myself would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl who brought up with atmosphere, married to a problem and formed her life with a castle, to the bottom of the world. Yet? 
Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He's not one of those who so in his enjoyment, as by all accounts, the unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. Then, his prison. Shall we have a short stroll? Sure. Pleasure? Dead! 
Your brother Ernest dead? Christ dead. Mr. Webb, I offer you my sincere condolence. You have a list the consolation of knowing that. You are always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, a sad no. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No. We died abroad in Paris and Quebec. I had a telegram last night from the Grand Hotel. What was the cause of that mentioned? A severe case of Oh, Uncle Jack, I'm pleased to see you back. But what colored clothes you have got on? Do go and change that. My child, my child. What's the matter, Uncle Jack? You look so sad. Do you look happy? I have supplies for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? Your brother Ernest. He arrived half an hour ago. I don't have a brother. Well. It's nonsense. You couldn't be so heartless to disbelieve him. I would have to come out and you would shake hands with him, would you, Uncle Jack? Well, my brother is in the dining room, but I don't know what it all means. I think it's perfectly absurd. Oh. Brother John, I've come down from town to tell you that I'm very sorry for all the trouble I give you, and that I intend to be the friend of mine in the future. Uncle Jack, you're not going to refuse your own brother's hand? Something will induce me to take his hand. I think he's coming down here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Do be nice, Uncle Jack. There's some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor friend, Mr. Burnbury, whom he visits so often. There must be much good in one who is kind and infinite. Oh, he has been talking about Burnbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Burnbury and his terrible state of health. Burnbury, well, I won't have him to talk to you about Burnbury or anything else. I think it is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Oh, of course, I admit that the force were all on my side. But I must say that Brother John's coldness to me is peculiarly painful. I expect a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering this is the first time I've come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I'll never forgive you. <laughs> never. <laughs> never, 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 never. Not to see so perfect a reconciliation, I think we might leave the two brothers together. Certainly, Miss Prison, only the task of reconciliation is over. Really, give a diary? I'll give anything to look at it. May I? 
to come out here. I think Mr. Murphy is sure to be back soon. And you can bring tea. Yes, Am I looking at you for my glasses? Oh, that's a lot of grandeur. I'm very fond of being looked at.
Puede. You are no doubt, or some female relative of the one you beside here also? Oh, no. I have no mother. No, in fact, any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prison, has the oddest task for looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's war. Oh. It's strange that he never mentioned to me he had a How secretive of him. He grows more interesting, are you? Cecily, I am very fond of you. But I cannot have this blessing of which. Well, just a little older than it seems to be, and not quite so alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly, Pray do, Gwendolyn. I think when everyone has something unpleasant to say, we should always be quite candid. To speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish you were fully 42 and more than you should play. Fellas, has it not right? <gasps> I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Do you say Ernest? Yes. But it's not Mr. Ernest Murphy, who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. He had never mentioned to me that he had a brother. Oh, I'm sorry to say, they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, that's a counselor. Of course, you're quite, quite sure that it's not Mr. Capenna's birthing your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I'm going to be his. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Dear Spendalyn, there's no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. I think there must be some slight error, Cecily. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. I'm afraid you are under some misconceptions. Dear Grandin, <coughs> Ernest has just proposed to me exactly 10 minutes ago. Certainly very curious. For he asked me to be his wife yesterday at 5 30. If you care to verify this incident, pray do so. I'm so sorry, dear Cecily. If this is any disappointment to you, but I am afraid I have the pie cake. You would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn. It would cause you any mental or physical anguish. But I found bound to follow that since Ernest proposed to you. He clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow is entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may get into, I will not reproach him after we are married. Ah, uh, you allude to me, Miss Cardio, as an entanglement. You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Did you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest in their engagement? How dare you? <laughs> this is no time to forward in the shadow mass of madness. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I'm so <laughs> glad that I have never seen a spade. It's obvious that our children's spirit is widely different.
pray you sit down and discuss this. Shall I make you some tea? Certainly. Sugar. No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Bread and butter. Bread and butter, please. Cake is very easy in the best house nowadays. Lumps of sugar, and I ask you more distinctly for bread and butter. You have given me cake. I warn you, Miss Cardio, you may go too far. To save my poor innocent, trusting boy from any machination of any other games, there are no names to which I will not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. You are false and deceitful, and I'm never deceived in such matters. It seems My to first me, passion, I can tell you that. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I'm trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. Cecily, 
It is very painful for me to be forced to speak about the truth, but I please speak frankly that I've no brother Ernest. I've no brother at all, and I never even have a brother in my life, and certainly won't have the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. You have no brother at all? None. Oh. Have you ever a brother of any kind? Never. Not even of any kind. It is clear, Cecily, that neither of us can engage to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young lady to certainly find herself in. Is it? Let us go into the house to hardly venture to come after us. No. Men are so cowardly, as they. Oh, Gwendolyn. Cecily. Don't leave me, Cecily. Gwendolyn, I love you. Know that? Stop leaving. Stay with me. follow us into the house as one. Seems to me that they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins that looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice that at all. Couldn't you come? But I haven't got a car. They're looking at us. They're approaching. That's where from is there. a dignified silence. Certainly, that's the only things to do now. La, 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 la. Meaning that I'm 
engaged in this still weapon, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Mr. Worthing. Yes. All communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. I am engaged to be married to... You're nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as we go to Algernon... Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. Mr. Worthing, may I ask, who is the young person who has had my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seemed to me a peculiar, unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cowden. My ward. I'm engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Mr. Mulgrave and I are engaged to be married, Lady Brandon. I think some preliminary inquiries on my part will not be out of pay. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardiot at all connected with any of the large railway stations in London? Well, Miss Cecily Cardiot is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardiot. Miss Cardiot's family solicitors are Mugby, Mugby, and Mugby. Mugby, Mugby, and Mugby. It is the firm of the very highest position in that profession. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Brettel. I have also in my possession. You will be pleased to hear certificates of Miss Cardiff's birth, baptism, blue pink coat, registration, fascination, confirmation, and the measles, both the German and the English variety. Ah, a live Friday with incident. I see. Though perhaps too exciting for a young girl. I am not myself in favor of my premature experiences. Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of fact, Mr. Welding, I had better ask if Miss Cardew has any lived to fortune. Oh, about a uh, hundred. And... Thirty thousand pounds in the funds. That is all good by Lady Brother. So pleased to have seen you. A moment, Mr. Worthing. A hundred and thirty thousand pounds. And in the funds. Miss Cardio seems to be a most attractive young girl now that I look at her. <laughs> Come over here, dear. Pretty child. There are distinct social possibility in Miss Cardiff's profile. Oh, that lady is the sweetest, dearest, and prettiest girl in the whole world. And I don't care two pence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, are you not? Only people who can't get in we do that. Well, I suppose I must give my concern. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Lady Pen. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta in the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Brendel, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I do not approve at all of this moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? But then we have to not trouble. <laughs> Impossible. I fear there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London, on an important question of romance, he obtained my house by false pretend to of being my brother. Aha. Uh -huh. After care. After careful consideration, Mr. Worthing, I decide to overlook my con nephew's conduct to you. Oh, that is very generous of you, Lady Brennell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. 
Come over here. Here. We count. How old are you? I'm really only 18. But I'm a detective when I go to evening parties. You're perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be so accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18. Well, it won't be long before you're of age, so I don't think your guardian's consent is of any importance. Oh, but it is only fair to tell you, according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Carter does not come legally of age until she is 35. It does not seem to me to be a great rejection. 35 is a very attractive age. Edgy, could you wait for me till I was 25? Of course I could. You know I could, Cecily. Yes, I felt instinctively. But I couldn't wait all the time. I hate waiting five minutes for anyone. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardio states possibly that she cannot wait till she is 35, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Brando, I do not give my consent. Upon what ground may I ask? Arishnon is an extremely eligible young man. He has nothing. We lose everything. What more can one desire? Oh. The passion of celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. You must be. That is not a definite proposal, Wendland. Arishnon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have already missed five, if not six trains, to miss any more as we by exposure to a poor man on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the questioning. The questioning, sir, is not somewhat premature. But both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age, the idea is for us. Am I to understand that, that there are to be no questionings at all this afternoon? Well, I don't think so. As things now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chesterfield. I'm grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthy. I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I've just been informed by the pure opener that, for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism, did I? Here you mention a Miss Prism. Yes, Lady Brendel. I'm on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This may prove to be one of vitally important to love Brendel and myself. Is Miss Prism a female of an impalant aspect and be mortally connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is always the same person. May I ask? What position she holds in the household? Miss Prism has been for the last three years Miss Cardew as new governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. Oh no, <coughs> she approaches. She's not. I was told you expected me in the bedroom, Lady Helen. I've been waiting for you there for an hour. Prism, come here, Prism. Where is that baby? 28 years ago, left Lord Brandon's house in charge of a basket, then came the a baby of the very sex, and you never returned? Prism, where is that baby?
I've realized for the first time in my life 